sometimes you need to play those back because you need to uh, catch up on things. All right, so we are now officially recording, so let's get going. Um, thank you to everybody who's keeping up with just dropping that bit.ly in um, over and over again for attendance. I will pull it up again towards the end of the session for anybody who joins a little bit late. Um, housekeeping items, as we get started here, please keep your microphone on mute so that we can stay focused on the content that we have today. Any questions you have, as I said, drop them into the chat. Hopefully Coralina is still out there, although she's been a little radio silent right now. Hopefully we didn't lose her. Um, attendance is required, so please make sure that you, you keep that bit.ly on hand for every single session that you attend today and make sure that you're filling out so that you get credit for all of the amazing learning. Um, presentations and recordings will go into the conference course, so that Brighter with Brightspace course there. Um, we are asking that you give us until the end of the week to have the recordings ready to go. They take time to process, plus um, for a lot of the sessions, they were offered on day one and day two, which means we kind of get to pick the recording that we like, which one, you know, was a little bit better. Um, so uh, give us a couple of days to get those recordings added there. And then one little tip that we figured out after the first few sessions on day one, um, some people were saying that the presentations were just really small on the screen. If you use the spotlight layout, as your option in Google Meet, that will keep the presentation large and not all those little thumbnails of the people in there. I know it's lovely to see the people, but if you're really trying to see what I'm doing on the screen, um, either in my presentation or when we're actively working in Brightspace, that spotlight, spotlight layout is going to be your best bet. Um, that's under the snowman in the center of your Google Meet bar, those three dots. If you click on those, you'll see layout, and then if you choose spotlight, um, that will one uh, should give you the best view of the presentation there. All right, and here is our agenda of what we're going to cover today. We've got three big topics that we're going to touch on that have to do with the um, ways to communicate inside of the Brightspace platform. We have email, chat, and instant messaging. Then we're going to talk a little bit about the comparison. I mean, if you have three options, why would you choose A versus B versus C? So we've put together sort of a flow map for you guys um, that offers some suggestions of why you might choose one over the other. And then we're going to wrap things up with just a little bit of a, you know, we were trying to be silly here, why you still need to Google Meet. So we're going to talk about some ways you can use Google Meet in your classroom as we get back to face-to-face, -face, which is great. We won't be so dependent on it, um, but how it can still be valuable to you and your students there. So, um, to cover a couple of big things before we get into this, I know communication in Brightspace was covered as a part of, I believe it was mod three in all of those trainings you guys went through. We are going to touch on a lot of the same stuff. We are going to talk about that email, that chat, and that instant messaging. So um, be aware that there isn't anything incredibly revolutionary or different from what's there. Um, the idea in having this session in the conference was for all of our new teachers, all of the folks that went through that in the um, mods, but it was just so much information that you didn't really have a chance to process it and so on. The other big thing that comes up when we start talking about Brightspace email, somebody eventually is going to ask, does that mean Outlook's going away? No, we're not doing away with Outlook email. Outlook is still the primary email that you are using in the district. Um, uh oh, Coralina's locked out. Yeah, we've hit our maximum limit. Um, okay. Um, Ms. Connolly, you want to jump in and be my, um, my moderator for the chat for me? Okay. Um, fortunately, that means I'll have to shoot Coralina a quick email here. Does anybody have Coralina McKenna's email? Can anybody email Coralina for me? I'm Hang texting on. her. This is Lisa Radicky, and I'm texting awesome. her. Can you let her know she's off the hook for this session? She must have gotten kicked out, and then when we hit that 250 limit, now she's locked out and can't she, get back into her, the session. She said her computer crashed. Uh, okay. Okay, let her know we've got this covered. So we're gonna we're gonna take her off the hook for this one. Thank you so much, Lisa. I didn't want to take time out of the session to have to open my email and send that to her. Oh, you're okay. welcome. I got it. 
Awesome. Thank you. Okay. Uh -huh. So what I was starting to say, Outlook is still going to be our primary mode of communication in the district. What Brightspace offers us is the ability to email within our classes. And especially for my elementary folks, when your students have never had email in the past, they do inside of Brightspace now. So you have the ability, Ms. Monger is cheering. Yay. So you will actually have the ability to communicate with your students via email, even at the elementary level. So I want you to think of Brightspace email as being that place where you can communicate about instructional things and your Outlook email is still going to be your professional email, okay? All right. With that, let's go ahead and get in. We're going to start off with that very first topic there, that Brightspace email, but it's no fun to learn about things sitting here in a presentation. So I'm going to hop out of the presentation and I'm going to spend most of the time here in Brightspace going through that. Um, all right. All uh, right. Mel Connolly, I do have one more job for you. Coralina was supposed to be my respondent for all of, I was going to email her and have her email back. So I'm going to have to enroll you in my course here as we get into this so that um, you can be my, my assistant on this one. And when I email you, you just email me back. All right, Perfect. guys. Thank you. Okay, so here we are in Brightspace, and I'm just in my sandbox, that same course that all of you guys have. And if you want to get into your email, the easiest way to do that is from the mail icon that appears up here on your mini nav bar. When you click on this, email is right here inside. Now, it is usually a good practice to go to the course first before you click on the mail icon because the easiest way to find people is using the address book and I'm going to show you guys that here in just a second but if I'm outside of my class if I'm just here on the landing page for all of Brightspace when I go to the address book it pulls up everybody in Brightspace in AACPS and yeah I can search for somebody by their name or their username but it's a lot easier to manage a very small list of people enrolled in my class so we really recommend that you find your course from your waffle before you send an email if it is going to people who are enrolled in your course so I'm going to click here on my email except that I have to get Mel Connolly enrolled in my course. Give me a second. Let me add Mel. Okay. Tracy, Tracy I made it. Oh, she's here. Awesome. All right, Mel, now you're off the hook. <laughs> Sorry, that was a mess. Woo, we are all over the place today. Okay, so I'm going to click on email there. And then you have the compose button right here to start a new email, or you can see existing emails, which gives you the ability to click on something and use a reply, reply all, the same things you expect in your Outlook. So I'm going to start a brand new email by clicking on compose. And then I mentioned a moment ago, the easiest way to find people is using the address book. One of the things I want to caution you guys about, our email addresses in Brightspace are not the same as our email addresses in Outlook. So I don't simply want to type in, you know, klmckenna at aacps.org because that's not her email in Brightspace. So that's why this address book is so crucial. If you click on the address book and you scroll down, you will see a roster of everybody enrolled in your course, whether they're students or teachers with you. And you can simply click on the person that you want to send an email to or several if you're going to email a bunch of people. And then I think the one step people tend to forget, they just, they just click on the person and then they click add recipients and they're like, how come it's still blank? What, what happened? What did I do wrong? What you want to do after you check a box next to the person you want to email is you need to tell Brightspace where you want to put this recipient's email. Is it in the two? Do you, are you CCing them or are you BCCing them? So I'm going to click that I am sending this to Coralina and now her name pops up or her username pops up here in the recipients to field and I can click add recipients. That way I can choose multiple people and choose I want to send the email to these people, I want to CC this person, and so on. So now I have the ability to put in a topic and then type in the body. We have some standard options like attach a picture, put in a link. If I scroll down, I can even upload attachments. I can record a message to her and so on. Once I have everything in there that I need, I just click send. 
and I have successfully sent an email to someone inside of Brightspace. Now, you will always know if you have a new message in Brightspace because if you look at your mail icon, you'll see an orange dot on it, just like you see an orange dot here on my update alerts, my little bell there. So when Coralina has a chance to email me back here in a moment, we're gonna see an orange dot pop up on my little uh, message alerts right there. We're gonna give her a moment to get that email sent back to me. But one of the things I wanna show you guys while she's doing that, I'm gonna pull up my Outlook here. By default, when you send an email to someone else through Brightspace, when someone else sends an email to you through Brightspace, you're gonna get a copy of that in your Outlook. It's going to say it came from outside. You guys see this red message here? It says, caution, this email originated from outside. You may see those when you get emails from your vendors, your textbook providers, and things like that. What is important to know is that these emails that go to your Outlook, you cannot reply to them. Outlook cannot send the email back to Brightspace. And the problem with that is, honestly, it doesn't tell you. Usually, if you try to send an email and it doesn't go, you get a message that says there was an error, that email didn't successfully go. You don't get the error message in Outlook. So you really need to think of these forwards to your Outlook as just being a notification that you need to go to Brightspace, open your email to reply to that. Because if I just click reply right here, nobody's going to get that, okay? I'll also show you guys in a few minutes how you can turn off those forwards. So if you don't want these sent and received emails to go to your Outlook, you can just turn that off, and we'll show that in the settings in a few minutes. I'm going to go ahead and close out of my Outlook because that was the only reason I had it open was to show you guys that forward. Hey, um, Tracy. Yeah. Um, I'm in there. I saw my little dot that said I have an email. I can see the email, but I don't actually see the email. When you click on it, if you scroll down a little bit, do you see it underneath? Uh, you know what? There, I had to. Yeah, it's because this big white box down yeah, it was all probably, the way. It was all the way closed. Yeah, it takes up a it takes up a lot of room, even on a big screen. So you got to move that down. Okay. Sorry. Um, okay, so while we're waiting for her to reply to that email, because it was covering so much of her screen, um, we're going to give her a minute and not ask if there are any questions in the chat yet, because she's trying to multitask and do this here. But I'm going to go ahead and show you those settings while we're waiting to get um, that email back so that I can show you that, that option there. So still here inside of the mail, if I go to settings in the upper right, you can see here right at the top that it's checked it says send a copy of each outgoing message every time i send a message it's going to go to my outlook if i don't want that i uncheck it the other one is way down here at the bottom where it says forward incoming messages to an alternate email account and you can see i've unchecked that one so there's two places that you can uncheck but both of them are on by default so everything's going to go to outlook if you don't want that just turn them off, okay? There's lots of other options to set up things like signatures in here, um, but you guys can go through the rest of the settings on your own. Those are the two that are really important. So I'm gonna cancel out of that. And let's refresh. There we go. Awesome. So let's say I'm back here on my course homepage and I see that orange dot on my mail icon. And that tells me I have a message. When I click on it, I can see the message right here and I can click. And really all that does is take me back into the mail where then I can see the email here, select it. It opens it down in that window underneath. I can see what Coralina typed and I have all the standard options across the bottom that you would expect from your Outlook. I can reply, I can reply all, I can forward this, I can file it into a folder. We'll talk about folders in just a second. I can even flag it and then under things like more, op more actions, mark it as read, um, change the course offerings, print the email, and so on. Coralina, any questions? Yes, there are. In the chat, yep. Yeah, there are several. Um, so um, it looks like uh, there is there is a question about going over how to do the how to find your colleagues' emails. Um, and students enrolled will populate, will parents populate, um, or just students? Um, will students be able to email each other? 
Um, I don't know about the parent um, one yet. Um, I believe that is something that we were interested in. So I think that's coming, but I don't know when it will be set up yet. And I, I just, I, I don't want to try to say something and give everybody the wrong impression when, when honestly, I'm not sure um, at this time about the parents. Will students be able to email each other? Um, let's just say they won't see each other in the course. However, if they know, um, the email address, then they can actually find each other. So it's just a good idea not to tell them that um, in Brightspace. Uh, did I miss, was there another one? Um, there's that and then the, the last Finding one, colleagues. Yeah, there's finding colleagues. And then there was um, one right up here. So I just lost it. Um, do we need to update the, the settings for each course? I'm not sure what um, Mr. Hoffman did by settings. But. No, so prob probably what they're asking about is that forward to Outlook. Um, when you change your settings in mail, you're changing your settings in Brightspace email. You don't have to go into each class and change that. So it's it's one time to uncheck those two areas and you won't get those forwards to Outlook unless you go back in and you check them again. Okay, so um, I'll show you how to find your colleagues. I'm assuming they're saying a colleague who's not enrolled in your courses. So um, I'll show you guys that in just a moment. Let me cover one more thing here before we go back out and uh, show you guys how to search that address book for colleagues not enrolled in a class. So across the top, the same place where I clicked on the compose, you have a folder management button over here on the right hand side. And right now, having done nothing, having set up nothing in this course or in my mail rather, the only folders I have are my inbox, sent mail, drafts, trash, and the address book there. I can set up folders here just like you could in Outlook where I can file things away for my science class, my social studies, grade three, grade four, however or whatever is meaningful to you. You can just click on folder management, choose new folder, and create something and that way you can organize your mail here just like you might expect to organize your mail in Outlook so that things are filed away into folders that are meaningful for you. All right. So let's go back to the landing page for all of Brightspace. So again, I'm assuming the question about emailing colleagues was those who aren't a member of a class right here. So if I click on my mail icon and I choose to start a new email, Same, I'm going to click on Compose and I'm going to go to the address book. But because what it's going to find is every single user in AACPS in Brightspace, starting with those, you know, numbered non-actual people, no. What I want to do is search. So if I know that I'm looking for Carrie Lambert, I might search for Carrie, I might search for Lambert, I might search for K.L. Lambert if I know what her um, username is, and that allows me to just find that specific user, check, put that I'm, click on that button to tell uh, Brightspace that I want to send the email to her, and that way I can search for each of those um, colleagues uh, in there without having to scroll through the entire address book. Okay, um, let me skim through my notes here and see if I got everything I wanted to touch on for email. Coralina, any questions coming up for this one? Yeah, I just want to reiterate that your address book contains your students, which will be populated when this when your class gets populated. Because uh, there's some confusion about why people aren't seeing some or people are only seeing some people. Um, so, can you search by school? Can you and can you create a DL, a distribution list? Um, I don't know the answer to either one of those, but I will um, follow up and find out. So DL and search by school. Yep. Um, should parents use Brightspace or Outlook email? And I think that's probably a best practices question. Yeah, some of questions like that sometimes just need to go to your administrator at your school because those are the types of things that come down more from the OSP side of the house um, in terms of policy. Is, is there a right or wrong answer to that is not something that I can tell you guys. That would definitely be something that would have to go to your school administration to say, you know, is there something that you prefer or that we should definitely be doing? All right, so we are going to transition away from talking about mail and we are going to get into talking about chat. 
So I am going to go back into my sandbox class here. And we're going to start talking about a great alternative to email, which is chat. Now, if you don't currently see chat on your nav bar for your course, the first step to creating or getting into a chat is to add it to your nav bar. So we can see that mine is here, but I'm going to go through the steps to show you how to add that just in case you haven't seen that yet. So anytime you want to add a new menu option to your nav bar, you simply come over to the right hand side and click on the three dots that tell you they are the actions for your nav bar and choose edit this nav bar. Then you click on add links. Everything here is alphabetized. So if you're looking for chat, you scroll down to the C's, you check the box and you click add. And then you can also organize your uh, menu options on your nav bar in any order that's most meaningful for your class. So you can see my chat is right here. I'm ready to click save and close. Now, putting chat on your nav bar means it's on the nav bar for you as the teacher. It's also on the nav bar for your students. But your students can't do anything in chat until you start a chat room or a live chat session for them. So even though they see the menu option, they don't have the ability to start a chat or engage in a chat with their classmates. All of that has to be started by you. So when you're ready to initiate a live chat with your students, you're going to click on chat from your nav bar. And then you'll see a list here of any existing chats that you've done before. And you have a big blue button up here to create a new chat. You give your chat a title. So we'll call this Office Hours 2 because I already had an Office Hours up there. You've got an area down here where you can type in a description to tell your participants what's the purpose of this chat, maybe what time it's going to be available, anything that you like. Again, options to add things like images, links, and so on in that description area. And then we have two options up here just between the title and the description that ask you what type of chat are you creating? And the two options are general versus personal. And you can see we added in parentheses next to personal the word recommended. And I'll talk a little bit about why we prefer the personal chat over the general chat. But if you want an idea of what these two things mean, what is a general chat versus a personal, this little question mark here will actually tell you when you click on it that a general chat means everybody in this class can join this chat. A personal chat tells you you can invite people who are in this class, meaning they're on that members list, but you can also invite people who aren't in the class to join this chat. So that's the first thing is that personal allows you to actually invite people who aren't um, on your class list. Maybe your administrator wants to come to your chat. Maybe your school counselor wants to be available for your chat. So it gives you that opportunity to add people from outside of the class. And we'll talk a little bit more. There's one other reason that has a lot to do with control after a chat is done for why we prefer personal chat. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. And then just this little note here that says, hey, once you create the chat, you cannot change the type. So if you pick general, you can't make it personal later. If you pick personal, you can't make it general later. So I'm going to choose personal chat. I've got my title and I'm going to click create. So now we can see my brand new chat down here says office hours two, and I'm ready to choose the participants, the people that I want to allow to be a part of this chat. And that's done in the little drop down right next to the name of the chat. I choose view members. And then I'm going to click on add members to search the roster for this course. If I want to invite people who aren't a part of the course, I click on add personal contact and then I can search for somebody. Let's do Carrie again, Lambert, search, and I could check and add Carrie to this one as well. I won't because she's probably conducting her own session. So right now you can see that we have a chat set up with two people in it. It's myself and Coralina and I click done. Now that chat is open and active and to get into it, I just click on the title and I have a box down here to type a message.
Several people can join the chat. I know I only added one person, but you can have several people in the chat. They can come and go. They don't have to stay. So if you're hosting something like office hours, you could tell your students, hey, I'm going to be available in the chat from 3 p.m. to 5. Students are doing their homework. Student doesn't have a question until 3.45. They hop in the chat. They get their question answered. They hop out. All right, we'll give Coralina a minute to get in here with us. And since we're waiting on her to jump into this chat and respond, I'm going to go into the settings for this one as well and show you guys um, some of the options in here that you might want to consider. One of the really cool options in the chat settings is up here under alias. My name in Brightspace is Tracy Brown but my students don't call me Tracy Brown. So you can change your alias in the chat so that it's Ms. Brown, or maybe my kids call me Ms. B, whatever I want. Students cannot change their alias. This is for staff members only. Then um, we've got some options for colors, messages old to new. But if we scroll all the way to the bottom, we've got some great options here for notifications, um, incoming messages. Uh, you want to be notified when a person enters the chat or when a person leaves the chat. This is super important to me if you're multitasking. If you're doing something like a two-hour block of office hours, you might have another tab up and you're focused on something else. You want to be notified if a kid jumps into your chat, if somebody posts a new message that needs your attention. By default, all three of those notifications are off but you can set them to different sounds so that you get one sound when somebody joins, a different sound when somebody posts a message, and so on. Get your settings and click on save. And now we can see Coralina's jumped in. She's so tied up in that chat, the one over in Google Meet, that she's barely got time to come in and jump into this one. All right, so we can engage back and forth. And then when either one of us are ready to leave the chat, she's gotten her questions answered, I'm done hosting the chat, we have a button down here in the bottom left that allows us to exit out of the chat experience. Now let's come back and talk about why we prefer personal chat. Even though I, as the teacher, have exited out of that chat, right now I can't prevent my students from joining it again. So I'm no longer in the chat. Coralina could hop back into that chat. If I had invited Carrie Lambert, she could join her in the chat and they could be having a private conversation back and forth. There are transcripts and I'll show you guys that in just a second. So it's not like they're truly having a private chat. I can pull those transcripts whenever I want. But I really don't want to tell you guys you have to go back and check your old chats regularly to see if the kids have been using them. No, I want to prevent them from using the chat when I'm not there. And that comes back to why we prefer that personal chat because if I click the drop down and I go to view members, I have the ability to actually remove people from the chat and then click done. This chat room, this chat experience still exists and I can use it again tomorrow and invite different people. But because I've now removed her from the chat, she can't get back into it. And that's why we prefer the personal. One more thing I forgot to show you guys when I went into view members to add them the first time. If you do want to add the whole class, you do not have to sit here checking off each one of them. If you just check this box at the very top, right next to where it says last name, first name, it just checks your whole class. So if you're holding a chat for everybody in the class, you don't have to invite all of them one at a time. And that's literally the only thing you get with general chat is the ability to invite everybody. But if I can do one check and invite everybody to a personal chat, it's preferred because I get that level of control that I can remove them all after we've finished using the chat today. Coralina, questions popping up about chat? Let me check my notes. Um, I think we got them. Um, you were going to go over dis are you going to go over discussions? Like a discussion board? No. What the difference between discussions and chats were? Um, uh, so a discussion usually starts with a prompt. 
posted by the teacher. Like today we're going to talk about this. Chat would be a little bit less formal. Um, it would be an opportunity for you to just say, join me if you have any questions at all. And they can hop into that chat experience to ask questions about homework, ask questions about the content that was covered today, um, and so on. You did notice it's a text-based chat, so you can certainly still um, choose to do things like using Google Meet if you'd prefer to talk to and see your students as opposed to having a text-based conversation. Um, but, but this is just a little less formal than a discussion because I don't have to post some kind of a question or a prompt to kick it off. Um, and I, so there are a few of, um, there are a few people asking this, uh, yes. Yeah, so when you, when you leave, if you don't want students to be able to use the chat, then you would have to remove them and add them when, when you want them, when you reopen the chat. That is preferred. The other option, and I think I just saw somebody post this um, into our Google Meet chat there. The other option is you can delete a chat. I mean, I can click the drop down and I can delete this. However, one thing that we caution, um, if you are going to delete a chat that was used previously, I highly recommend pulling any transcripts from it that you may need in the future. Once you delete a chat, you can't get the transcripts from it. So it's kind of important to think about the order of that before deleting it. So I'm going to click on this old one that I've used here called office hours and what it's going to do is open up sorry I needed the view sessions sorry rewind click on the drop down next to the old one and choose view sessions and this is going to show me every time I've used that original office hours one and if I click on a particular time or date that it was used this is your transcript for that chat. This one's not very interesting. Clearly, I didn't do anything in that one. I literally just went in and then hopped right back out. Here we go. Now we get one with a little bit of commenting back and forth. You have a print button in the upper right hand corner that would allow you to keep a copy of this transcript. If, um, if a student ever said, hey, I think you gave me the wrong answer to a question, you can go back into the transcript and say, no, I, I have the answer right here. I can see what I wrote. Or if a student said they joined you for office hours and you said, no, you didn't, transcript is there. If you delete a, um, a chat, um, an entire instance, like one of these that says office hours or homework help, if you click that drop down and you delete it, you can no longer get back into the old sessions and pull those transcripts. So think about whether or not there's something meaningful that might be in any transcripts of those. Pull those, print them before you delete the chat just so that you're covering yourself. Okay, um, that's everything on chat. So one more time for the questions before we transition. Yeah, I think that was mostly it. If you delete it, the kids are obviously being kicked out. Yep. Um, you can, you showed where the PDFs are, so that answered someone's question. Oh, and there is, do students have access to their, do students have access to the chat history in case they need to reference something that was discussed? No. Once you've ended the chat, they don't have a transcript for that. All right. There you go. Awesome. Okay, so once again, let's transition, let's get away from chat, and let's get into our third type of communication, and that is instant messaging. So I've just jumped back to my home page to kind of clear away some of the visual noise right here. Instant messaging, a great alternative again, but an alternative for staff only. Students have no access to instant messaging inside of Brightspace. This is for you to communicate with colleagues and only communicate with colleagues in here. So instant messaging is actually found under the same icon we clicked on to get to mail. It's clicked on, it's this little envelope icon up here. And you'll see next to where it says email, it says instant messages. So you can click on that and it opens this smaller little window here on the inbox page, you can see a history of all of your instant messages. You have options to set them as read, unread, delete your history. Then we have a tab in the middle here called friends. If I want to generate a new instant message, I can only message people on my friends list. So I have to get a person on my friends list before I'm able to message them. And you can see right now that I have three people on my friends list. Carrie Lambert and Paige Richardson are coworkers of mine. Graham Brown is my son. He's a student in AACPS and I added him on my friends list to show you guys specifically that you can find students in instant messaging if you try to message them.
you don't have permission to send a message to this user. That's what you'll get every time. So I don't want you guys to get confused. Like Tracy said, we can't instant message students, but here they are, they're showing up. They actually show up, but you cannot message them. So just because you can find them doesn't mean it's going to let you message them. All right, so back to that idea of adding a friend here. If I want to message Coralina, I'm going to click on add friends here in the upper right hand corner. And honestly, I've found these two options are pretty much the same. I don't know why there's two options, search users or add by username. So she is KL McKenna. I assume it's thinking. Come on, I clicked on, I clicked on search. Come on. I don't know why it's not finding her. Let's try Mel Connolly. Mel, are, Mel, are you M, M Connolly? MC. MC. I knew there was an extra letter in there, but I couldn't remember. E L L Y. Okay. Whew. Got to get all these letters correctly. And now it's. one too many M's. MC Connolly. Connolly. Sorry, I put a Mick Connolly in there. I don't know why I can't find anybody this morning. Apparently, this is not going to go so well for me to show you guys how to instant message people when it won't let me find anyone this morning. Isn't it fun when you're trying to show people how to use something and it just stops working for you entirely? All right, let's try that one more time. Let's go to add friends. We'll try the other option there. We'll type in a username. K-L. I can, uh, I can spell. Enter. I try to send you a message if that's any content. Oh, good. It does say message successfully received. So somebody can find somebody. I just can't find anybody in here. I All right. So we'll go to my inbox. Look at that. I've got a message. Awesome. So you'll also get that orange dot showing up on your mail icon um, when you have an instant message. We'll give that a minute. Sometimes they're just a little bit behind when the messages come in. And when you click on the mail icon, if you look at the icon to the left of the message, um, you can usually, actually that's funny, that looks just like the mail one. Okay. So instant message, there it is. It popped up. That's weird that it took me into the mail. So it's not telling me I have an instant. There it is. Okay, so the icon there shows you that it's an instant message as opposed to the mail icon, which looks like the little envelope there. This one has the little dot, dot, dot in that chat bubble. Okay, then you can click to actually see the message and respond. And click send. I'm going to come back to my friends list for just a moment to show you one additional thing. The whole idea behind instant messaging is the instant part. I want to communicate with someone right now. When you go to instant messaging and you go to your friends list, this green dot will tell you if the person is available right now. So if I'm interested in messaging Paige Richardson, I can see it says she's offline which means if I really need a response from her right now, instant messaging probably isn't going to do it. I'm going to want to email her. I'm going to want to call her. I'm going to want to text her. I'm going to want to do something else that she might see sooner than an instant message that requires that she sign into Brightspace and notice that orange dot pop up on her uh, mail icon there. Okay. Any questions coming into the chat about that incredibly successful demonstration of instant message? <laughs> Um, well, permanent subs or long-term subs, um, do they have, what do they have access to in terms of communicating with students? You see me picking up my notes. I don't know the answer to that one, so I will have to find out that one as well. So we're interested in what subs and even permanent subs have access to in terms of communication tools. Making my little notes here so I can follow up for you guys. All right, anything else? There is a question, why do they show up as anonymous users? Anonymous users, my goodness. I yeah, I'm not ever seeing yeah. that. Yeah. Um, what is the pro con of Instant Messenger and Brightface versus other modes of communication already oh. available? So that kind of starts to get to what we're going to talk about next, which is um, 
actually that little flow map that we put together for you guys. But one thing I want to do before we go get that flow map, hey, let's do the attendance one more time for everybody. So we'll drop this into the chat. If you missed the attendance link earlier, please make sure that you're filling this out for every class that you attend today. Instant messaging. Good, good. Okay. All righty. So let's talk a little bit about why use one versus the other. Um, when you have three different options inside of Brightspace, and then you've also got Outlook email, and you might have a whole text message thread that has all of your um, teammates, your department, or something like that. So why would you use what's available inside of Brightspace, and why would you choose one versus the other? Um, to me, the one ease of using something inside of Brightspace is if I'm already in Brightspace, I'm, I'm actively working on something in Brightspace and I think oh, I really need to find out from her if she wants to do A or B or I really need to clarify with this person whether or not we should, we should be planning for this or not, then it's very easy for me to access the communication tools that exist inside of Brightspace. If I'm not actively in Brightspace right now, and I have a, you know, a text message group set up with my coworkers, I, I could just as easily grab my phone and send a text message to the group. So it really depends on what you're doing right now. If you have to get up, go upstairs to your computer at home, log into the computer, log into Brightspace in order to message them, I'd say no. Use something that's more immediately available to you. But if I'm already in Brightspace, why not use the communication tools that are in there in order to talk with colleagues, students, and so on. And certainly when it comes to communicating with students, it really is going to be one of your best options because they're all in there if they're on your roster for any of your classes. So one of the things we put together was what we're calling a little communication flow chart for you guys. And it just helps you decide which one of the Brightspace tools you might want to choose in any given moment. Um, so it starts with the question at the top, which is, are you trying to correspond with a staff member or not? So let's follow it down the left hand side first. If the person you want to correspond with is not a staff member, they are a student. Then the next question is, is that student available now or at a scheduled time for you to meet with them live in some way? If the answer is yes, Brightspace chat is a great option. If the answer is no, the student's not available until 6 o'clock, you're not available at 6 o'clock, then Brightspace email is going to be your best option for corresponding with the student. If we go back to the very first option at the top, are you corresponding with a staff member, and we follow it down the right, if the answer is yes, that person is a staff member, the next question in my mind is, do you need to correspond with more than one person? Are you trying to reach three people? Because instant messaging is one-on-one. -on -one. So I'm not going to choose instant messaging if I need to correspond with several people. Um, and then we get down to that same option. Um, are your colleagues available right now for live correspondence? If yes, then you can use Bright Brightspace chat um, or instant messaging. If, um, if they're not available, we go back to that Brightspace email or again, even your Outlook email. Coralina, anything in the chat? Uh, nothing that is relevant to this. Okay. <laughs> awesome. Then let's get past this. Okay. So our last topic here. Great. We've got five minutes to talk about this and some resources for you guys. Um, Google Meet. Last year, so much of our professional life was right here in Google Meet. I mean, if, if we didn't have Google Meet or some other type of video platform, you know, we just, we, we wouldn't have been able to connect with each other or students for the majority of last year. So now that we're all so excited to be getting back to face-to-face, what purpose does Google Meet have in our lives moving forward? Some of the obvious ones right there across the top. Set up some virtual meetings between staff members. You don't have to be in the same place in order to meet together anymore. I know that for your smaller meetings, you know, your department meetings, your grade level, those team meetings, it's nice to be face to face. It's nice to actually be able to pick up a document and lean over your shoulder and be like, yeah, what do you see? What do you think? So those types of things absolutely get back to face to face. But don't feel like everything has to involve people meeting in the same room. Virtual meetings are a great option. 
Virtual meetings between staff, students, and families. This is something we were promoting pre-pandemic, that if you've got family members who can't meet with you um, because they don't have transportation to get to the school, if you've got deployed military parents and guardians, offering a virtual meeting is a great way to connect with one another and let them be involved in what their students are doing in school while they can't physically be here to come to the school. Um, virtual collaborative classes is one of the things we are really hoping that people will embrace this year. Um, get your science classes together within your school or between schools. Let students work collaboratively in small groups with a class at a different school. Um, that's really going to give them the ability to connect on more of this global scale that we're really trying to promote. And one of the things that virtual meetings and video conferencing has really opened up for us is this ability for students to collaborate with somebody who isn't physically in the room with them. Um, and yes, the district is on board with this. I know last year with things like breakout rooms, there were all kinds of restrictions and people were like, I don't know what I'm allowed to do and what I'm not allowed to do. Um, and so they were hesitant. The district is a hundred percent on board with collaborative meetings between groups at different schools or even within the same school. Um, a little tip down there for your Google Meets, use nicknamed meetings to control student access, um, meaning that once you end the meeting, they can't just hop back into that meeting. However, keep in mind that nicknames cannot be super common. Like I can't create a meeting and just call it my meeting because I don't own that meeting, which means if somebody else types in the nickname, my meeting, they're actually using my meeting and they think it's theirs. And then we have issues where people are like, oh my God, my account was hacked. Somebody was in my meeting. No, you just picked a really generic name that somebody else also chose. So a really good example of a good nickname is like your username followed by the class name or the club name or the group name or something like that. Because we all know that our usernames are unique. That's why I'm not just T Brown. That was already taken. I can't have that username. So we end up with these sort of unique usernames in order to make sure that they are definitely unique. All right, anything about those virtual meetings, Coralina? Um, no, someone had asked if it's an expectation in elementary as well. I assume, Laura, that you are asking about the collaborative, like, classes, um, and I don't know. Um, I don't know that we want to use the word expectation. Um, I think we want to use the word option. Um, you know, as we move forward and we get back to face-to-face, -face, we're all hoping people will embrace the digital tools that worked really well in the last year, but you're not required to do something simply because another teacher at another school is using it. Um, we want you to know your options and we want you to embrace the digital when it works well for you and your students. All right, so with our last minute here, I wanna show you guys where you'll find all the resources that we have put together for you guys so that you can keep up with Brightspace email, chat, instant messaging, all of these types of things. So on your ClassLink page, you have a website called Teacher Intro to Digital Tools. There's a sub page or a page on there called Brightspace and then finally a page under that called Communication. I'm gonna click and go to my ClassLink and show you that exact resource. What you're looking for on ClassLink is the big Google G. It says Teacher Intro to Digital Tools. When you click on that, you've got your menu options here across the upper right. You're going to choose Brightspace and you're going to go down to communication tools. And then we have some things we didn't talk about today, like one way communication. Two way communication is more of what we focused on today, that email, chat and instant messaging. We have short videos on each of those as well as some printable directions. So if you learn better by printing something out and physically reading step by step, those are there. And then we have the same flow map that I just shared with you guys to kind of, you know, consider why you would use one versus another. And with that, we can go ahead and stop the recording. I think I was the one that actually clicked on the recording, so I might just... <laughs>